this finance and budget committee meeting to order as the ranking member. Um, the first thing on the agenda is we're going to do the election of the FY21 um, chair and vice chair. Um, I would like to make a motion that we uh, appoint Dr. Liza Warner as chair and uh, Ms. Irene Hollerback as vice chair. Second. Okay, do I, um, do we want to vote on that? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Um, so uh, do I have any uh, adjustments to the approval of the agenda? Um, I had received uh, an email from, a, cons from a, a teacher asking about the leave policy and wanting to see if we could uh, I don't know in the policy 41. Yeah, that's on the agenda. Something. We have a couple policies for the, um, this is the one about um, the May expiration for leave of right. absence. Right. So do, should we talk about that here or is that going to be on the agenda for Tuesday? Or? It's on the agenda for Tuesday. Isn't that a couple that, yeah, Pat, uh, well, Missy's not here, but there's a couple of, gen, there's a couple of policies based on what's occurring need the board to take action. Should, should we add that to this agenda so you all can talk to us about it or should we just wait till Tuesday? Well, I would, I'm looking to Chris and that may be unfair, um, but if I don't think Patrick's on here, he would be the best one to speak to it. Okay, so we'll just wait then. We'll wait. Right, okay, yeah. so motion to approve the agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Do you want to start with old business, the FY22 budget calendar? Budget calendar. Yes, ma'am. So we brought the budget calendar at the last FAB meeting in June, but uh, since we had some change in the FAB and then we are bringing this to the full, uh, full board on this coming Tuesday for information and then approval at the following meeting, uh, wanted to have one more look at the FAB meeting, uh, uh, give the FAB members another opportunity to look at the budget calendar and see if there were any recommended changes. Uh, part of the attachments is the um, letter sent over from the county administrator just laying out what the dates are that line up with the um, county. And we did try to line up our dates with the, the county's budget calendar. Um, I, really, I do have... Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just had one question, which was I, I see that on um, August 17th, we send all CIP project sheets supporting documentation to county budget staff, but that's before we as a school board have adopted the CIP priorities. Isn't that kind of putting the heart cart before the horse kind of thing? Yeah, um, I agree. This is, you know, we are constantly working with the county. So they're trying to get a, for what we are starting to propose to the school board, they want to start to get a lead on preparing all the documents. So they know that it's not final information. They just want to start getting that detailed information together to pull it into their CIP document. And, you know, we're working closely with them throughout the year. Um, anyways, they, they've added that date in there to try to give a, a formal deadline of, um, of getting that information to them. Ms. Healy, do you have any questions? And um, we, you know, one of the items on the FAB agenda tonight is the CIP. So um, actually, I can't remember. I think we started talking about it at the last FAB meeting. Mm -hmm. But as you see, that's kind of the first thing that's really um, we're going to hit the ground running here in, in July, August, and September with the CIP. So just pointing out that that's a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, county staff, we've Obviously, as I said, we've been working with them and they know that we've got a lot on our plate right now between the school board and the and the staff. And, you know, they're going to work with us as much as possible on on getting that information to them and being flexible with us. OK, I just don't want you know, I just if the, the school board decides that the priorities are different from what comes up for information, I would hate for it to go across the street and then be very different from what we adopt. Um, Hopefully that doesn't happen. You don't think they could? Perhaps this, if we have a special meeting in August would. prior to our regularly scheduled one, we could ask that this be put on the agenda. Well, one of the nice things is we'll be able to put this, uh, the CIP on the agenda for Tuesday and, and do preliminary discussions. So if there's any tremendous deviation, we would know. 
by by the 11th. Is that acceptable? Well, I, I agree with Dr. Chase. It doesn't seem like um, it's appropriate to send your request over before they're adopted. So it's uh, maybe the difference is, Chris, this says request for county and school projects due and versus the adoption of the priority. So is is the projects list longer than the priority list? So the project sheets that they're referring to on the 17th are, um, we just have detailed sheets that lay out the timing and the funding sources and expenditures for each year for each of our projects. So they're trying to get that information loaded into their larger CIP document listing. Um, so they just want all of that background information to them ahead of time, even knowing that you guys have not formally approved the CIP, uh, so that um, with so they them can waiting. So they the can move the priorities around if there, so there will be no priorities attached to the project sheets that they're going across. It's just Absolutely. here a bunch of projects. Okay, that, 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 yes, that makes that, me more That makes sense. Maybe we can um, clarify that when we report to the the board. Yes. Because I know I was confused about this as well thinking they wanted the list before we adopted it, but it's yep. different. Okay, so do we wanna go ahead and recommend to the board that we um, accept this um, budget calendar proposal as it is? Chris, are you okay with these dates for the presentation of the year end summaries? That's 15th that, of September yeah. seems a bit optimistic. Yeah, we don't put them on our calendar, uh, but it is on, I think you're looking, are you looking at the county's calendar of when they present the urine information? It, yeah, the, the draft that we have from um, Mr. Presley says oh, yes. on Tuesday, September 15th, there will be a presentation of the preliminary FY 2020 schools and county year end summary of financial results. Yeah, it it's early, but by that point, we've do have preliminary results. So I'm comfortable with that date. It's usually pretty tight and we've communicated, we worked, the county worked with us, I should say, last year to make sure they gave us enough time. Um, the way our accrual periods um, with uh, governmental accounting work is we really can't start officially closing the books until about August 31st. And, and so it's after that, that we start really wrapping up and can finalize the numbers. So by the 15th, it takes us a, you know, a couple of weeks to get there to finalize them. Uh, but the county works with us to make sure they give us up to that last minute. A lot of time we don't even have the information included in their board packet um, because obviously I've got to um, get that information to the school board first before we even include it in the county's presentation. Uh, so it's a tight turnaround, but I'm comfortable with having preliminary results by then. And, and how is that presented? Is that presented to the board of supervisors by the county staff or by our staff? So the school um, part? last year was a joint presentation that I believe I think I attended their FAB meeting and maybe their actual board meeting. Um, so they present their county information and have a few slides talking about uh, the school's preliminary results. And we actually did the same thing for the quarterly uh, reports, at least for the first and second quarter of, of the next year. Uh, so this would be in 21, uh, a similar um, approach where we present kind of with the, with the county staff. And Madam Chairman, I'd suggest that we um, let our board know that we're requesting that the presentation for the county to the county of the school's year-end preliminary results be presented to the school board in advance, even if it's yeah. the same day, because what we don't want is to hear it after the fact, after it's been presented. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'm always very cautious about that and making sure that we get the information to the school board first. And just one more question, Madam Chairman. Oh, absolutely. Um, Does our calendar allow that or do we need to change our calendar? No, our, our calendar allows for it because, let me go back up so I can give you the exact dates for, for our calendar. Uh, Dr. Kisner would have his presentation at the end of January, January 26th, and we're always shooting for usually the end of February for when the board, uh, school board approves their budget. And so um, the way the dates actually line up, it's February 23rd, which the school board would approve their budget. So um, the key is always, obviously, you guys would have to approve a budget before we can present it to the board of supervisors. And 
and luckily this year, because of timing last year of the way the county's calendar worked, the county administrator's presentation was about a week, maybe a little bit more than that earlier than it is in this calendar. So it created some some difficulties in trying to make sure that your approved budget was before the county um, administrator presented his budget so that he had all the information from the school board and the way the calendar has worked out this year, it actually works a little bit better that he presents um, uh, beginning of March after, you know, a couple of weeks after the school board has already approved the budget. Okay, so, so I think we all agree to go ahead and uh, submit the draft proposal for the calendar to the school board and um, and make these uh, clarifications recommended by Ms. Healy. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the capital of uh, the VIP plan. So I think that's in here. So there anything is, um, is Lionel, is Lionel going to talk to us about this? Um, yeah, so I'll give a, a brief intro and if, if Lionel is prepared to, he can walk through this document. I just want to point out um, a lot of work went into this this year between Lionel and John and their staff. Um, you know, in the past for our CIP priorities, we have a one page document and we really wanted a more um, fully inclusive document with a lot more supporting documentation. And so this is our first draft of that. And I think each year we can build and make it better and really pull a lot more information into it. So um, I'll, if, if Lionel, if you're on, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If you can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Chris. I yep. appreciate that. All right, so what I'll do is give you uh, a very high level uh, analysis of and reporting of where we are with our CIP for FY22 through 31. Um, I want to say that the facilities planning design and construction team uh, is going to walk you through this rough draft version. Uh, key term, rough draft. There will be some uh, numbers that will be adjusted um, and it's still open if there's ideas that you have as school board members as I'm talking that you uh, would like to share. This document isn't final yet. It's still a work in progress. I want to make that very clear. Um, as Chris said, you'll notice that this year's CIP report has been revamped. I think it's a little more visually appealing and easier to read. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to walk you through and feel free to jump in if you have any questions or concerns. Okay, to provide you a little background, every year the Stafford County Public School Superintendent and staff prepares a CIP that identifies the location, timing, and funding of both capital projects and repair, replacement, and rehabilitation projects, also known as 3R projects. And we do that over a 10-year period. Uh, the CIP is also updated every year and the order and priority of projects in the CIP can change to reflect uh, any changes in educational mandates, demographic shifts, uh, school capacities, costs, and or school board priorities. Um, I'm gonna now jump into the goals, sort of the goals of the CIP that staff has identified thus far is firstly to accommodate student enrollment growth. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to properly take care and maintain our existing facilities. Lastly, we want to provide a, a high quality facilities that meet the needs of students and staff. Okay, now I'm going to jump a bit to important dates to remember. And that's also uh, shown in the document as our calendar. Uh, August 11th uh, is the school board CIP priorities for information. At least that's what's in the in the calendar. Also, uh, August 17th, we have all CIP project sheets and supporting documents should be provided to staff. Uh, is in terms of the school board, September 8th is a big date on our calendar. So there's going to be information items on large scale CIP projects and the 3R infrastructure list. Uh, two weeks later on the 22nd, uh, school board action items on these uh, on the large scale CIP projects and the 3R list. And then I'm going to jump a bit to October 20th 
there'll be a joint board of supervisors school board meeting. Uh, next, I'm gonna jump down to December 1st. Uh, there'll be another joint uh, board of supervisors school board meeting and that will, uh, will uh, involve reviewing the final TRC recommendations regarding school CIP projects. And another important date to remember, and I'm probably jumping the gun here, but all the way out in April of 2021, the Board of Supervisors will adopt the county's FY22 budget and CIP. Lionel, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Yeah. So just uh, the August 17th date, when you say documentation should be provided to staff, uh, should uh -huh. that be county staff? Oh, I see, all CIP. Yes, that is correct. I would just recommend for clarification that you, you make that, that change. Oh, okay. I can do that. Yes, and All right. this, is, this is John, and um, that's um, draft information. We confirmed that with the county. We had the same question that you had earlier in the meeting. It's just draft information for them to prepare. Okay. Got it. I will, I'll add that in there. So and, John... Uh, John, are you suggesting that, that maybe it should read all CI drafts of all CIP project sheets and supporting documentation should be provided to county staff? Yes, that would be more accurate. Right. Okay. So, Got it. I'll, I'll, I'll add that. Make that change in the budget calendar as well. Yeah. Okay. I think that would definitely clarify. And, and... All right. Okay. I have, so, um, I have one more comment. Um, I want to make sure that I point this out because um, we're showing the information item on September 8th and the action item on September 22nd um, for this, which um, that's um, different than the, um, the budget cal the calendar that you were just looking at. And um, we, can, we can do this faster if you, if you think this document's ready to go for information on August 11th then um, we're fine with that. We felt like that with everything going on, we needed a little extra time. And the PD, people that we've discussed this with at the county were open to that. So we would just need to make that request if we want to go for um, information item on September 8th and action on September 22nd. Thanks, John. I was thinking we, we have a board meeting actually on 825. We could put this for information on 825 and then vote on it on 98 for action. Would that, yes, would that work? That would work. Yeah. that would work also. So sometimes we require a little more time on these projects. Well, if we it's, do it at 825, then we, we have a little bit of leeway, maybe. Well, is there a reason why we're not putting it on for information at the meeting next week? I mean, the agenda hasn't been posted yet, has it? Because if we're having public comments on the um, school reopening, we may not have enough time to really delve into the CIP because it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's a much more, it's a pretty complex document. Would we maybe want to think about just having it generally for information on the 25th and then it could be information again on the, I mean, I'm just to, to get eyes on it a little sooner, but I don't know. All right. My, my suggestion, if it's ready to present to the board, we put it on for information. We don't have to have that discussion. We can always have it on for information twice, but at least it will be out there. It will be posted the public and the school board members would have a chance to to review it there's always um what shall we say um very involved discussion on the cip so we want to put it on for information on 721 if if well we'd have or to get in touch we could do 811 you'd too. have to get in touch with the uh the chair and see if they they'd be willing to add it because the the I don't think the agenda has well, been posted well, we yet. Could has do it? 8 I could do 811 too, and then have yeah, it. Yeah, 811 is what the budget calendar says, and we're fine with that. We um we probably should have put that down there in the first place. So I apologize for that. We could do 811 for information, and then action on September 8th, just the way that it's shown on the budget calendar. So I apologize for that. I, I wanted to point that out so you didn't see that later and wonder why it showed something different. What? It, it just it, whatever you all decide will work, but my experience has been that information is required more than once for these discussions before the board's ready to to act on it. This year is unusual, so maybe we can get it, you know, get a reach a consensus on in one meeting. But if we could have two meetings potentially to have it on for information, 
I think we would be more likely to meet our, our target schedule for approving it. I, I agree, but I think that's why I said 811 and 825, and then yeah. we'd vote on it 98. So then we'd still be ahead of where it's currently. Right, and, and we can leave the count, we can have September 22nd, if indeed it takes two information reads, right. then it would be actually for action on the 22nd. Okay, so, so do you wanna, for clarity, put in in the calendar, first read of information, August 11th? Yes. And August, then and eight, seven, uh, uh, 825. And then uh, 825. And then, and then se at, September 8th, 8th would be action. Would be action unless more unless time is need needed. More, and then action would be September 22nd? Yes. Does that, does that make sense, John? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Lionel, are you still there? I saw it okay. might have gotten kicked out. Sorry, Lionel, yeah. you can you can go on. Okay, no problem. Okay, uh, so now I want to talk about some of our recent accomplishments. Uh, over the past decade, we've replaced uh, Moncure Elementary School. Uh, we've reconstructed Stafford Senior High School and performed major renovations at Falmouth Elementary, Grafton Village, Stafford Elementary, Ferry Farm, Brook Point High School, Colonial Forge, and Mountain View High School. We've also performed numerous uh, minor renovations and upgrades at all three school levels and have recently repurposed an existing building into the new North Star Early Childhood Education Center. Okay, so jumping ahead now to page nine, county approved large capital projects list. Um, there were five large capital projects that were adopted by the Board of Supervisors and listed in the county's FY21 uh, to 2030 CIP. They include two new high schools, high schools number six and seven, one new elementary school, number 18, and uh, the additional early childhood special education capacity of 10 classrooms. Uh, there was the Drew Middle School renovation. And one thing I'd like to point out is please note that although uh, Hartwood Elementary renovation and the North Stafford High School Fine Arts wing renovation were included in our CIP. Unfortunately, these projects weren't approved for funding in the county's uh, CIP. So now I'm going to jump to uh, page ask, number two. Can, huh? can I ask a quick question? This is just, just uh, uh -huh. so I see that we're, we're adding a new elementary school in 2030 but then we're adding additional special ed capacity in 2029. And then the Drew renovation maybe is in 2030. Will we need the additional, I mean, I'm just adding an extra elementary school. Are we going to need the additional early childhood special ed that quickly? I'm just, just curious. Um, yes. I can I can say that was part of the discussion this past year as it as it worked through the process of hey if we're adding an elementary school why don't we build in the space for the um, expansion as well um, it's a it's a valid question um, I don't I don't have an answer I will say this was what the board of supervisors settled on and then obviously you the school board can uh, make their recommendations for this year for the next ten year CIP. Madam Chair. Okay. Had Ms. Healy. I believe when we had North Star renovated, the projection at that time was that it would be completely full within the year or two. So at that time, I think the supervisors wanted to go ahead and have us look at building a new building, but we said we preferred to hold off on that. I believe we're going to need one well before August 30. Mm -hmm. And that's even using the space we have up at, um, you know, this, this uh, Garrisonville Elementary has some space that we have used in the past and, you know, may be available. I think we're going to have to relook at all of this based on, you know, this virtual and hybrid and, you know, what we have. I think we're going to have to relook at our growth figures. You know, depending, I mean, we, we assumed that there was going to be more uh, children coming into the county, which may or may not be the case, you know, in the immediate future. So I, I think if anything, that's going to have to be moved up. So, and Madam Chair, 
Um, so, so uh, Ms. Healy, what do you think in terms of, I mean, these things are, they're, they're sort of when the county feels like there's the money available to do these projects and then there's when they need to be done. And uh, so projections may change this year based on who's attending school and things like that. Is that what you're? No, I'm, I'm saying that the, our projections on a lot of this these projects was based on the growth coming into the county. And we were con considering a growth that would continue over the course of, um, you know, every year. And I don't know, I don't know if Mr. Fulmer knows or Dr. Kisner knows, but I, you know, things, things are, things have changed dramatically across the, the nation. So I, I don't know what students were going to get. I know at times when we had a lot of new growth in the housing industry, a lot of young families were moving in and there, there were more children. And then when the um, the prices went up and, and the, you know, the economy uh, changed somewhat, we had families moving in with children more in the middle and high. So I, I, I have no idea. And that's why we have the experts to do those projections. I think this, this is the list that was approved by the county. I think the school board has to come up with a list of what we see as the needs. Now, Ideally, they would match the affordability, but they've never matched in the past. Well, ideally, I think that um, as we move into it, which may be the reason that we need more information before we can make a, a, a complete decision on, on what projects we are going to prioritize. But I think that by, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm I, not I think political. it's going to be difficult to have that information on attendance and projections by September. So we may have to, um, we may have to base it on our, our previous estimates. Well, and, and um, as, as Ms. Healy has often mentioned to me over the years, um, this is a, a, a living, living docu document. document. Yes, that's the <laughs> so, adjective. <laughs> so indeed, it, it, it may be that, that what, what you're speaking about will be something that's going to, to change it in the next year, but maybe we can't address that at this point in time. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know that we can address it at this point in time, but it's also the county's funding and priorities may change as well. So I think that it's it's it behooves us to maybe try to stick to the calendar and and focus on the priorities based on the information that we've we've had in the past or or whatever information we can get in in, in addition as we move forward into this unpredictable school year. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that we're gonna get information and change priorities. I'm just putting this out there that whatever decision we make is going to be subject to change based on, you know, how the future uh, comes to pass. Absolutely. That's all. You're, you're absolutely correct. I agree with you. Liza, um, one thing just to, that it seemed to be in the past a little, little cause a little confusion um, was, and maybe it's just the wording of the school board recommended large capital projects. The, requested opening date not being in some sequential order that there should maybe be some is if, if it's your priorities because when you look at it you may i you know my first reaction we're building the elementary school as but then a year later we're hoping to have special ed classrooms so if the special ed classrooms were not completed would that move up in in front of the extra elementary school so somehow to note that the that the the date that you're opening it to be the school board requested opening date is your priority is that making sense that this it just doesn't it could be a little confusing when you read it yeah you're talking about ours where we have the the elementary school opening in 27 and that's our second priority and then the next priority is additional special ed classrooms a year earlier than the initial priority but I think there's something to there's something to to saying this is when we're going to need it. But if we have to decide which we want more, um, we want the ele new elementary school. S think that's more important than the additional classrooms. I mean, I, I yeah, I, yeah. I'm just you know for the budgeting from the county side, if Drew Middle School is a greater need than Hartwood Elementary School, but they put the money towards Hartwood Elementary School earlier, do you compromise the potential of having the funds for an earlier for for another project that would be later, but maybe more important? 
I I agree. I just think that it's one of those things we're going to have to wait until we we yeah. sit down with the board to really discuss those priorities and figure out what's going on in this upcoming school year, because many of our many of our priorities may have to be shifted, and you know our calendar is obviously not the same as the board of supervisors' calendar. So, and I think we have to list it in our priority order. I I agree. It's it it it, it looks a little odd. But because of the way the planning is done over the course of 10 years and the county's borrowing limits, it doesn't mean that these projects are all going to be funded in one year. And the county works very hard. Well, Chris knows more about this than I do, but I to, to, to keep the all the uh, allotments within their their targets for the the bond ratings and everything else. So because of the way these are broken up, um, that. 54 million 180,000 for elementary school 18 is going to be allocated over the course of several years whereas the the early childhood education at 9.3 million may be allocated you know much sooner so i i think we as a board need to to identify our priority order now that doesn't mean it's going to be accepted or approved because this has to go through a you know the the technical review committee and a whole nother process but that's you know that's that's what we need to do and are these numbers still valid chris do we know these so projections the yeah when were they when were the estimates done yeah, so, so and that's one of the rough drafts sorry one of the um rough draft piece of this is still ironing out those numbers um because every time the the date shifts on when the when the building is going to open the number shifts so so if you tell us, hey, we want to shift the shift this by a year, um, that is going to impact that, and I'll defer. Um, I'm I'm sure that they've updated these numbers based on if you're looking at our list and not the county's list, um, but both of them would have been updated to reflect the inflation for which year that building is expected to open. And I'll just add that that requested opening date, if you recall last year, the the requested opening date was driven by at least for the new buildings when we were hitting our capacity you know, 90% capacity in our elementary school and high school. And that's what triggered those opening dates. But as you mentioned, that might not be necessarily the priority order as Dr. Kisner and, and everybody is. Can, can you can you all provide a little more clarification on, so I see that we have proposed that the high school number six opens August, 2025, and we estimate the cost at 140 million, but the board of supervisors has it August, 2025 at 124 million. So, yeah, so even our number last year was higher than the 125 million with the, the same opening date or an earlier opening date. Um, and part of that goes to um, Board of Supervisors does not believe that um, the high school is going to cost as much as what we're projecting. And we, we took our projection based off of a cost estimate of rebuilding Stafford High School on a new site. Um, I had a professional cost estimate done and then take that and inflate it based on the same inflation um, calculations that's agreed to in the CIP by the by the county staff and adopted by the board of supervisors and it just projects higher and so I don't believe that the board of supervisors has been comfortable with that 140 million dollar number so that's why it's a, a little bit less okay and then similarly for elementary school number 18 we are projecting in August of 2027 that it would be 54 million and they're saying three years later uh, inflation will have only gone up a hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something like right. that is that is that are we comfortable with that um i don't john you remember uh more about how elementary 18 was calculated yes um and um back to um ms healy's comment um we we would really like to try to move toward what the county has already approved where we can so um, the fact that those numbers are so close, I'm not sure why, I and mean, we still need to justify it, but um, we're using a cost per square foot number for that um, elementary school project. And um, I think maybe what I would do is use the same number that the county's already targeted and then inflate it, um, show what the savings would be to build the school earlier, because we're, we're talking about building the school and, and opening it in 2027. So. Um, we need to look at that number more closely, but um, we are trying to align the logic. And in some cases, it's, it's just like what Chris described. They want us to build a less expensive high school. 
um, but our estimate says it's going to cost what it's going to cost to build our standard high school. So um, these these numbers is part of the, dis the that's part of the discussion with the county is um, we're we're saying that um, to build the school is going to cost this amount, but um, as much as we can find common ground. Um, the better. Um, I want to point out one more thing while we're on this. Um, we did, we are updating the cost estimate for high school six and we're including the, the estimated amounts in the site costs where um, we're looking at the, the top two sites um, that we showed you uh, for the closed session and we are um, um, just trying to align those numbers better and then have a, um, an up-to-date estimate for high school six. We've also got estimates now about 95% complete for Drew and for Hartwood. And so um, we'll have some good solid numbers there um, as far as having a professional estimator um, looking at it in detail and, and be able to provide that additional information to the county as well when we submit this information. So, and, and following this high level summary and, and just to clarify, you, know, you all already know this, but this was just our starting point to get something in front of the school board and getting impact from the school board of how do you wanna organize these? Is there another project you wanna add on or is there projects you wanna take off? So completely be aware of that, that um, in no way are we uh, saying this is set in stone. This was just our starting point, um, basically starting with the projects from last year with the high school seven added on as well um, as, a, as a potential item. But I wanna draw your attention after these, we've. Um, after this page, you get into a little bit of a description of what these projects are. And one of the things that's not in here yet that I, that there's a budget section that says it's a TBD right now that we're working on. What I want in there is, is, a, is a good explanation for how these costs have been estimated for the year that we have them in. And that's the, for, for your benefit, but also um, we've, we've done that work behind the scenes and we have hundreds of pages of documents to support a lot of this information. But um, when we send over a one page document to the board of supervisors, they think that it was, um, it gives the impression that that one page document is all we have to support it, which isn't accurate. So with, with having a full CIP document like this, we're hoping that um, it gives more information to the school board to justify these numbers, but also as we send it across the street to the county, um, it lets them know the work done behind the scenes and how these numbers have been generated. If, if you recall last year in the FAB, this was one of our goals. Um, we looked at the Arlington model and obviously Lionel came from Arlington to help flush it out. Yeah, so I have a, another. Uh, so, so uh, John, you mentioned that, for example, you had a better number for, for the Drew renovation. I mean, I'm kind of surprised that uh, what we sent over last year that we were estimating that that Drew Middle, a renovation of a school would cost 80% of building a brand new elementary school. Yes, but then I see in the county, they're, they're suggesting that, that it's substantially less for that renovation. Um, do you have any updates on? on? Yes, ma'am. And that's exactly what we're trying to react to. So it's a great example. We, we looked at that project and, um, and there was not a, a great um, estimate um, back up for Drew, and they've pointed that out at the county and said, we really need you to have to look at that more closely. So we have had a professional estimator um, look at this, and he just turned in his um, estimate. Um, I think we got it yesterday, and I'm looking at it right now. It's about $30 million. So we're going to go over that in detail with him and um, see if there's anything in there where we can uh, reduce that further. Um, we're looking at um, system replacements, and we know what we want to do with that school. Um, so we started with the scope and, and tried to keep it very practical because we knew we didn't want to come back with as high a number if we could um, if we could reduce the project some. So we're, that's an example of we're trying to go in the right direction, and we're going to be looking at all of these numbers more closely. So when you see this as an information item, these numbers are going to be um, slightly different, and, and we may we may come back because we would have had um, some continuing discussions with the county. Uh, we'll come back and, and it'll just be a more solid document when you see it again. John, that that number, well, the 30 million that you mentioned, is that a 2020 number or a 2030 number? That is um, that is 2020. And so when you escalate it, you're right, it's going to, um, and we talked about escalation with the county, so it's going to drive it up. Um, but when we go over this estimate, we're going to be really looking for anything that might be considered as fluff and, and try to get it to just the basis, because that building needs a lot of work, and we don't want to drive the costs up so high that it can't be done 
um, sooner. So we're really working on these estimates and also just trying to make sure we provide good backup to the county so they see that we're, um, you know, we're looking at this very closely and we, we're not taking this lightly. These are very expensive projects. How do we calculate inflation for these? This has been a discussion with the county, and they also need to calculate inflation with their projects. And so we had a meeting um, just a week ago, and we talked about it um, in detail. There's a uh, there's there's sort of um, standards when you're in a situation like we are right now. Um, it's it's really hard to project what the market is going to do, and the inflation is is basically market driven. So when construction is booming, then the costs tend to go up faster than normal, and then when the construction market is is lagging, then the, the cost goes go down. So we had a a lively discussion with the county, and uh, one thing that we pointed out is they like to go with a low number, and so if we also go with a really low inflation rate, we're liable to be in trouble with the project once that it's funded, and so it's um it's part of the discussion that we um that we that we work with the county as a team and try to figure out how can we make sure that it's going to be a very successful project and i think they're committed to that as well so um they they just want to make sure we're being as frugal as we can um as we're as we're building these um new buildings and, and renovating buildings dr warner i'll just point out it um kind of as a footnote on this document you'll see that we have inflation the escalation rates in there. So years one through three are at four and a half percent, and then years four through ten are at three percent per year. And that's where John mentioned we're working on that with the county. So um, I don't know if those numbers are going to be tweaked a little bit, uh, but that's what it was, I believe, for this most recent year and what we currently have in the CIP. Yeah, and I think they're tweaked. Um, I I um, I need to look at that more closely, but I'll um, I'll look at that and and it'll be updated when you see it as an information item. Any other questions? I have um, a couple. The elementary school 18 and the high school both show the additional capacity we're going to add. Can we uh, put something in the descriptions for the other, the the um, ECSE? It, it says 10 classrooms, but what capacity that's going to add? Because in effect, it whatever it is in a classroom, it's going to be times two, will it not, since we have AM and PM? Uh, yes, ma'am. So th that's one question that the supervisors seem to be, you know, r routinely asking and looking for information about how much capacity will this add. And it, in Drew, it says it's going to be more efficient. So I would think that we may be getting some additional capacity there. But and then in, in Hartwood, we're going to be adding, um, you know, more space. So there's going to be additional capacity. I think it's something that they're going to ask. So if we can anticipate that and include it, I do have a question in the Hartwood description. In the first paragraph in the project description, it said it is assumed and hoped that county water can be extended from the urban service area to the school site prior to the project start date. Now, is there a basis for that assumption? Uh, I know no, the basis for the that, hope. that needs to be removed. That's not a that's not a good comment because they're not going to be they're not going to be extending the water um, by that date, and the building needs to be renovated. So, um, thank you for pointing that out. I apologize. I think that's just an, an old comment, and um, we don't need to have that in there because it's not based on getting water to the urban service area. It's based on renovating the school because it's in um it's it's um the the condition is not. Um, adequate in many instances. So I apologize for that. And remember, this is a draft. Yeah, and at the time that, that it was initially drafted, and we probably pulled this in for another document, but it, um, with Westlake um, in the works at some point, I know it's been delayed, I'm not sure the current status of it, the urban service area was supposed to come closer to Hartwood, which would make it then more affordable, less expensive, maybe still expensive, um, to then finish that run from wherever, wherever it's ended to get to Westlake to Hartwood because it's um, a lot closer once they brought out the urban service area, extended it to Westlake. I, I, I just wanted to be sure that if we put something in there, if we're assuming something that we can back that up and preferably with information we've gotten from the county. Matter of fact, the, last year the, the, county, the county actually had a document just telling us basically that's not happening. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's correct. So that's they've been telling us that for years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's one of those mythical. That's a unicorn. And I, I know the the county has been clear in the past that they wouldn't 
support a remodel of Heartwood Wallet yeah. or a rebuild while it's still on, on the web. And then also, even though North Stafford High School Fine Arts Wing is not on the, the current list, it may end up on the list. So if we could add, you know, some information about the additional capacity. Is the additional capacity in here? What the additional capacity will be from this uh, this renovation. It's, it, it really is something that the supervisors are interested in, and we can show that that we are actually doing more than just um, renovating what's there and ending up with the with the same capacity. And yeah, and I can speak enough. to that, um, Ms. Healy. The the Drew renovation, we are going to be able to create um, some new classrooms, and we'll definitely add the capacity. Um, we'll show the capacity when we update that description. Um, with Hartwood, we're really not planning on adding any capacity because of those limitations with the water and sewer. Um, that's one of the challenges with the school is it, it really needs to stay the same size with the infrastructure that's there, with the um, mechanical systems and the, um, the, the, the building itself needs to be updated. Um, once the water is run out there, whenever that is, that will be a plus because we can um, no longer depend on the, um, the water and the, the sewer um, facilities that are there now. But those are, those are fairly new, so um, we don't really need to have the water and sewer to renovate the building. And um, we need to do something there because it's not on the three-hour list, and, and they're just going to continue to have problems if we don't, if we don't do anything at that, um, at that school. But the project description states that the two additions for this project are planned to address a 12,800 square foot space deficiency for the elementary school program. So I, when I read that, I understood that to mean that we were going to add 12,800 square feet in the and renovation. On yeah, and that's from last year. So um, when when we're updating this, and, and I apologize, there's just been so much going on. I should have read this and, and caught that. Um, but we have had a lot of discussion about that and with the county. And um, it's the systems are not really designed to add um, classrooms there and add more students. So we need to update that description for sure. And I appreciate you pointing that out, Ms. Healy. And if I recall it um, from last year's CIP, I think it's adding some square footage, but it might be um, more to like library and the common area space, not as much as actual classrooms. The more classrooms and, and uh, if you actually add capacity, we run into problems mainly with our actually water sewage tank. There was only permitted to so many occupants of the building and, and we're close to that number as it is. Um, may I ask a, another question just about the Drew Middle School? So uh, Drew currently houses the Heather Enfield Day School. Is that going to, I mean, are we viewing, if we're, we're looking at a multi-year CIP, are we viewing that as continuing to be in Drew? Are we rethinking any of that or expanding it or in, in, any, any staff have anything to add to that? Yes, our assumption was that it would stay in Drew, and um, of course, if that could change, that would also be something that can add capacity, but since we don't have a, a solution for that um, program to move, um, we don't want it to be dependent on that, um, on that program moving, so we, um, right now, it's assumed to stay, and so we just need to align our assumptions and our estimates and, um, and update all of these descriptions and um, uh, make sure that um, these are all um, accurate with the assumptions that we've used. And then some of this can change because, again, this is a draft. And um, if we have a, another location for that um, program that we want to propose, we could work it into the plan. That's what these discussions um, will be about. At Drew, um, at Drew Middle School, um, you're saying that the square footage, um, the planned square footage is still to be determined. Are we waiting for an assessment on what we can do out there, what we can, how much we can add, or is there some other factor? Yes, um, so, so we have met out at the schools um, several times and we're discussing what they need um, with the principals and, um, and staff at the schools. And so um, that's one of the reasons these have changed since last year and they just have not been updated. Uh, with Hartwood, we did have a, a library expansion in our earlier um, program. And um, because this has been a difficult project to get even on the county list, um, we're, um, we're going to be coming back and, and recommending a much more basic 
renovation, if you've um, addition, if you've gone to Hartwood, you see that there's storage in the hallways. It's just um, they lack storage space like no other school, and it, it really is a um, it's an issue there. So they need a small addition for storage and and basically support, and that's what the school is saying they're needing. So we're aligning at what with what the staff at the school say, and, and the same with Drew. They really need a better music space. And um, when you go there, it's um, you go in that band room and Drew, it's just um, it's just not a great situation at all. You pretty much have to step across the band cases, the, the instrument cases. And it's um, um, it's just it's right there at the front entrance. It's not a um, it's not a great situation at all. So the logic we're using is working with the schools to get what they are requesting to be done to the buildings. And in these two cases, it's reducing the cost. So um, we're all for that. We're not trying to make them exactly like the other schools, which um, we could do that, but it's going to drive up the cost. I, I think my only concern with that, for example, at, at Hartwood is we've done a beautiful, you know, we have beautiful library spaces at every other elementary school. And so the decision to do storage instead of updating the library but maybe the library will also be updated in some way. I mean, I just sort of. It, 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 it has been. It's um, it's a cute, it's a cute library. It's, it's really nice. And um, it's maybe not as large, but that's the type of thing we want to talk about with you and, and decide, but it's, um, it's a decent library and the principal and the staff there are happy with it. Madam Chairman, it, it may be helpful when we present our CIP with these additions and the renovations that we also include somewhere in the the transmittal our projections for our enrollments because you know a lot of this is is based on the, the increased numbers I, I think that everyone knows that the, the supervisors seem to be in agreement the last time we uh, presented this that high school number six needs to be here you know, based on our numbers and looking at this we're not adding any capacity to middle school over the next 10 years, because this is a 10 year plan. And it may be that that's fine, we don't expect it, but I know that the schools in, in my district are, they're getting up there. I think one is pretty much at capacity, the other one's not too far away. I imagine yeah. Drew is very close. So I, if, I agree with be you, helpful. but there is room, at, currently there's room at Dixon Smith, so that could, help some, but I don't know. I don't, I haven't seen the latest 10 year projections. Yeah. What well, well, just so, because that would be a question I would raise, you right. know, all right, you, you want to do these renovations and we understand this is a very old school and it needs the renovations, but are you considering, do you need capacity? So we can show that based on our projections, we're going to be fine with the capacity. Then to me, that would support our request, you know, for putting these renovations as a priority. And if in fact, it looked like we needed some more capacity in the middle schools, I would suggest we look at perhaps relocating the, the day school. I mean, we've, we've you know, leased the space for the um, Phoenix Center. I mean, there, there may be some other alternatives for that because my understanding is that, uh, you know, a project has, has taken over more space in Drew. And that was fine when Drew had a small population, but the population is, has grown there. So it's just something to think about, especially if we're talking about a significant renovation, because a renovation for the day school would look very different than a renovation for the middle school. So I, I want to make sure we're, we're good on our middle school seats over the next 10 years before we dismiss possibly using that uh, space and I'll call it the lower level. <laughs> well, so, that's what I was wondering why uh, the two be determined because I thought that's what we were adding is extra capacity. And I thought maybe it was, so that's why I was looking for some clarification, but I agree. Yeah. I think that adding those projections are certainly important information for justifying our I just want to CIP. Add as, as part of this document, we do have the, the most recent enrollment projections. Now they're still five they're six or seven months old now yeah the 10 and you're it's going to be hard in black and white the way they're on here it's really we're, difficult to read i wouldn't what page even, are they on I'm, i went 37 i didn't get that far yeah <laughs> oh i can't so we have that a, yeah <laughs> that's why it's, the, the electronic version of documents is probably easier and can, maybe can we put that up oh I, well they're just i mean i personally hope unreadable. the school board has a conversation through middle school renovation versus Drew Middle School new building. 
um, because there's well, a lot of limitations the, on that piece of property. I mean, this. Well, looking a, at the you know. cost projections, like you pointed out, it's like 80% of the cost of a new construction. So it, it, it certainly is, um, it is cer certainly something that we're going to have to consider, which is most cost-effective use of money. Great to add a middle school and then Drew Middle School could become a alternative school of, of some sort. Right. I mean, Drew is a very fabulous location in terms of 95 and Route 1 and, and all of that. But um, yeah, so we could certainly have that conversation. If and I, I just want to respond to what Ms. Healy said. The, um, we can definitely show that the, um, the day school area is being renovated. And we have talked about if that were to be located somewhere else, that would add capacity. Um, we are going to be at capacity when we relocate the music rooms. So we'll, um, we'll show we, we're definitely adding some capacity with the Drew project. And then we can add more if we relocate the day school. And I think that's a great suggestion to have in the document as a, um, a potential option. And so county will have some suggestions because that's a joint project. And, and I, I do agree. I think we can pull some of this enrollment projection data, although it's in here as an appendix as supporting data. I think some of that key information should pull into the front where we describe the needs uh, to support um, because whether it's the high school or the renovations in elementary school. And can we make that print bigger? I, I mean, I can't read mine. I'm sorry. No, yeah. And it's it's very tough read? when it's in black and white and 37? small like that. It's I can't read it at all. Yeah. Oh yeah, that. Well, I'll wow. give it. I'll give it Lionel. To, we can one turn it to a in maybe a landscape mode as well. And and yeah. when, it, when in black and white, it's really tough. Yeah. And Okay, Lionel, do you have, do you have other yeah, things? Yeah, they're not, the they're not on this there. projection. I've um, worked with Matt previously and, and Lionel at the beginning of this year about having better projections for our ECSE. It's really tough to project the ECSE more than really a year or two. We know what comes up the pipeline. Um, but we were able to take trends, and we've started that. It's on a separate document, though, but I think um, – I don't believe it's in here, so that's a, a good point. And, and Healy, we'll add something for that. Right, and didn't – Mm -hmm. Lionel, are you ready for me to speak about the 3R? Mike. We, we uh, need to yes, be able to justify why we're making that a priority and asking to spend, you know, nine point some million dollars. Yeah. But, you know, but there, there might also need to be a conversation about the numbers may be deflated during the pandemic. Is that correct, Dr. Kisner, that you're finding... Well, that fewer parents are wanting these really little kids to be in in school. Yeah, I, I also will say when we get to September 30th numbers, I would not have as great confidence of this year's September 30th numbers compared to last year's. You know, so we want to get these numbers in a way that you'll could see it first and and maybe use that as your trend line because every school system is recognizing that their September 30th numbers are going to be deflated, reduced, yeah. Well, and I don't and, think that would be surprising to the supervisors, but I, I'm, I'm just thinking it's important when we show our priorities. I mean, my priorities are gonna be based on what we need and my need is gonna be based on these projections. Yeah, and that's where I think um, when we talk about the high school and we have a, the background information about the high school, I think, at a minimum, if we can pull the high school projections and put them right there with the high school, so it's very clear where the justification of the need is coming from. And then when we talk about an elementary school, we can pull in those elementary school numbers and, and really show it there. We can still have the projections in the appendix at the back to have the, the see the full ten-year picture with with all um, thirty schools plus adding the ECSC schools. Uh, but I like the idea of pulling more information into the actual background. I, I don't want to complicate it, but I I, I think. That note about the inflation, it has more meaning when you actually see the dollars amount. If you see what a 4% inflation is, um, I know in Harrisonburg, that's what we would do. We would do every three years, we would show the new number. And that gave a greater, it became a more interesting conversation when we talked about potentially delaying a project. What would that, with borrowing rates and everything. So 
Uh, uh, is this something that concerns? I actually love that because it's a conversation that comes up at every board of super, joint board of supervisors meeting as well. And and Lionel, if you can make note of that, I think we can show for each of these projects, show what that current year dollar is, and then show what it is as it goes yeah, out would, over the ten I, years. I would show a table that shows the projected co the the, the Three, inflationary yep. amount and what that translates yep. into a dollar, so that it's yep. it's clear that it's not just one percent; it's you know twenty million dollars or something. Yes, ma'am. That's a great idea. Will do. I'll add it. So I. Um, and, and John might speak to this. You know, there's a lot of other little um, background information on here. Starting at 19, because this is the other piece that comes to the full board, is our 3R, so our smaller infrastructure projects. And there's a little explanation about what what constitutes a 3R project and, and, and what that looks like. Um, so each year, it lists those projects of, and when we think we need them. And it's not even when we think we need them. We do take into the budget a little bit. These projects have gotten pushed year to year as you as you are probably aware we've tried to do some year-end funding projects this year we were not able to do that because of so much uncertainty uh, but i, I want to point out if, if just on page 20 for our fy21 projects um, just because they're on this list doesn't mean they're getting done so if you look at that third column it says funding source and you'll see a little over halfway down it says unfunded so those projects don't currently have a funding source identified for them which means most likely uh, they might not get done unless we do find a funding source at the at the end of the year, and that and what that does is if if we don't find the funding source for those, let's say they install the generator or replace the generator at Park Ridge, what that does is now shifts to FY22 when we get to that when we get to next year and creating that document. So there's a little bit of a domino effect that things keep getting pushed. We only have uh, so much designated money from the Board of Supervisors for those three R projects, and we've. Are definitely struggling with with keeping up with those, and evident by you know chillers that are are breaking down. Um, I think the north actually one of the chillers here at North Stafford is still broken. To, you know, broken. We're trying to get it at least fixed temporarily until we can get it replaced wow, here this so winter. It's hard to believe this. I'm freezing in this place. <laughs> yeah, that's because we, we knew a, we we're going to be in here. So. Just a, a quick question on the three R projects. I noticed there's a couple like fire alarm systems that need to be replaced are those things um so they're currently prioritized or yeah. is there some code enforcement that we could run into with, with if we don't yeah clearly those? we need to keep, keep those operational and um was it a fire alarm system that we just had to had to replace it it's i forget where but no uh, star yeah, no, yeah, yeah, North Star. We just ran into that. Um, right, and it was um, it, we couldn't find the parts. It's it's um, they're they're out antiquated and they they don't have parts is a big concern. So they're not only old, they're going to break and we can't really replace them, um, or we can't repair them properly. So those are those are definitely a priority. And um, I can present these quickly. Um, the three R list is um, the three R's are uh, repair, replacement, and rehabilitation, and um. The um, so they're they're projects that are helping to keep our buildings in good condition, and we've had a lot of discussion about these projects this year. And um, what I've asked the staff is to recommend what should be our mission critical projects. In other words, if we don't fix it, um, what are we in jeopardy of of um, having a school shut down or having major disruption if we don't um, make the repairs? And um, or where do we just have? Um, mechanical systems that are not adequate, um, such as what you see with um, in FY22 on page 21, um, the the mechanical systems with um, Ferry Farm and North Stafford High School. Um, we're um, already um, ready to proceed with the, um, the mechanical room upgrades for North Stafford High School, but um, there's phases of that project because where you are there now, you've got old air handling units throughout the building. And so it's really an old system throughout and, and obviously giving a lot of trouble. Um, I think they did just cool it down more for y'all today than, than they should have, but um, we're having trouble with the chiller. So that's a mission critical project and we don't want to um, lose the school because of mechanical failure. And so we really spent a lot of time identifying those projects and we, um, um, we, we place them as bond funded projects because those are more certain to be funded. When you get down to the lower projects on the list, they're um, unfunded, as Chris was saying, they may or may not um, be uh, money available. So they, they get pushed to the next year. And uh, we ended up 
um, actually pulling some projects that we felt like um, need to be really looked at separately. And so later in the document here, you'll see some um, other funded, um, I'm sorry, other unfunded. And um, what we tried to do is we didn't want to use the three R list to just park projects that would not happen. And we want to make the three R list more predictable. Uh, because we're working with these schools and we're telling them when we would like to do the project and the previous process has been they get kicked from year to year so nobody really can count on this three hour list so we've had these on um, target numbers to try to get around 10 or 12 million dollars um, with it and uh, we know that uh, we on a good year maybe we're going to get all of those projects done um, a lot of times they're going to be pushed to the next year but at least we'll get these bond funded and the um, three hour set aside projects done and so um, when you get to the um, last pages of the, um, the 3R, when you get to page 25, um, you'll actually see some categories where we're looking at um, systems. And we're not saying these are not important, but there's some athletic related projects, some auditorium upgrades, some um, uh, media retrieval. Um, projects that um, we may need to spend some money on those um, to keep the systems running, um, but they're not quite as mission critical as the um, air conditioning systems and the electrical upgrades and the things that are going to um, need to be working well for the school to operate. Um, so um, this is a little bit different approach, and um, I think it also gives us a chance to um, reprioritize within each category. So rather than having paving projects scattered throughout the document, um, we're really looking at all of our paving projects together on page 26. And you see we have $12 million worth of um, pavement um, projects there that are, are, are basically from the previous list. We're now currently working on that and looking at the lots, looking at the age and, and really see which are our top priorities. And then we can also refine these estimates. And, um, and again, um, we need to repair paving, but um, we need more money for a lot of things with 3R. So it's just one of the things that's going to be pushed aside if we don't have enough moving forward is, is our parking lots will go in disrepair. Um, at least we're going to be update the priority and, and know which ones are um, most important um, throughout this process. So this is really continuing to be a big effort with our operations and maintenance team. And um, when you see this document, we will have... Um, updated it again and probably have some, um, um, we will have some updated estimates on this um, as well. And um, we're trying to just get the, get the things done that really are most important for the schools. So um, that's what this is all about. Does anybody have any questions about 3R? Uh, I, I don't, but I, I do just want to say, I, I think this document looks really good compared to some previous documents that I've seen. So it's, it's um, looking good this year. Yes, thank you. Ms. Healy, do you have any other questions? No, thank you. I want to thank uh, Mr. Anderson and Mr. White for all the effort that's gone into this. This is a great, and I'm sure Chris too, uh, this is a, a, a much more um, uh, rigid document that helps support our requests and our needs to the county. I think that it's especially putting it all in one place. I think it's I think a good job. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now find us $12 million. <laughs> you know, it, it sounds like money. It is a lot of money, but when you consider the size of our school division and the number of buildings and the needs that we have, um, I don't have the data in front of me. I know we've talked about it in the past, but industry standards show that we should be in reinvesting so much money each year in order to maintain your facilities. And, could and we're they, not doing that. Could that information be included in the document, like the standard amount that's reinvested mm -hmm. in the school for maintenance, but also maybe inflationary, how much, if we don't fix these projects, some of them, how much it would cost us you yes, know, to push, we, we pushing them down the road. Maybe yeah. not as, in as much detail as our um, other projects, but just maybe a general statement about it so that, so that we can um, explain how um, not only does do ignoring or being unable to complete these projects, maybe lead to greater costs later on, but it also causes, as, as Mr. Anderson pointed out, major disruptions. Yes, I can add that language. Okay, if there's not any other questions, um, the FY21 meeting schedule for the committee, um, is there a 
Since since Ms. Hollerback is not here, do you want to wait until the next meeting and we'll just try to schedule a meeting for um that that's fine. And perhaps we can um you can poll the members to see what days are preferred. We want to make sure it doesn't conflict with another meeting day and check with um Mr. Fulmer, Dr. Kisner. I'll have Missy send a calendar so that we can we can establish that maybe for the year. Thank you. COVID-19 expenses. So this is um, behind or would have been behind the actual staple document that you had that Angie would have provided to you. Uh, but the next two documents are, are in color, so a little bit easier to, to stand out. So first, I just want to say this is, I think Dr. Dr. Kinner, somebody I, I've heard it recently, probably getting sick of hearing fluid and um, this, these things are changing. We were, we were adding things to this today, taking things off. So it, it is, is constantly changing. There are things that we don't know about that are coming up. So this is very, very rough. Some of these are just for consideration. They're not required expenditures, but some of them are gonna help us greatly if we do pursue them. So um, it, was, it was asked to, to kind of pull these together and provide them to the, to the fab. And I believe a, a, actually a couple of weeks ago, we had a list that was a lot smaller, a preliminary list as we started pulling together with um, one of the things that hasn't changed is that enhanced contracted cleaning, and that was to do uh, the additional cleanings each week at, in between our shifts of, of doing that sterilization and that electrostatic clean uh, um, throughout the school year, and that's an, an annual cost. Um, we also have additional transportation costs. Those are, that's a, a very rough number right now. If you remember, it was well over a million dollars originally, but since we went to the four-day program with the fifth day being uh, more for uh, specialized um, instruction that um, it has has kind of taken us to a point where we can take the hours that we have budgeted for a bus driver and the bulk of them are probably going to be over the four days uh, with some of the drivers also driving on the Monday, but it, but it gets the cost down uh, drastically instead of trying to do five full days of, of every student or 50% of the students. Um, if If we end up at some point having to um, go 100% virtual for some portion mm -hmm. of the, the school division or the entire school division for some period of time, will transportation costs go down at that point? Uh, yeah, it should. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect, obviously, the additional costs. Um, we're still going to have transportation for, um, assuming we can get certain waivers and stuff from the, from the state, uh, but we would still and actually probably do an enhanced meal delivery model. So right now we have about 23 um, additional distribution sites. Um, we would maybe quadruple that um, given the point, given if everybody was virtual and so we could try to reach more neighborhoods um, out there. So it's hard to say right now, right now we don't even have our, the hard numbers on how many kids are riding the bus and who are riding the bus. So this number here is a, a very rough estimate based on initial calculations and, and projections. So as we get better numbers and, and Barry and his crew are able to develop those routes and, and split them up, we'll have better projections on what it's gonna cost to do the four day a week hybrid model. Uh, and the, but it would change obviously drastically if we went to 100% virtual model. And the um, supplemental childcare costs, what is, what, what is the proposal with respect to uh, if, what are we talking about potentially providing for staff in this estimate? So um, we are still working with YMCA, we don't have final numbers yet, but what we do know is there's gonna be some cost for YMCA to provide childcare for staff. And our concern is, is that um, being an unbudgeted um, cost to staff, whether whether it's a, a teacher um, or a paraprofessional or a bus driver, um, that's going to get expensive quickly um, when you talk about full days, um, two to three days a week, depending on on their schedule. Uh, so we don't want want it to we don't want to run into a situation where a teacher or a paraprofessional says it's not worth me even working when we're in a shortage and we can't hire teachers or bus drivers. Um, and we have paraprofessional vacancies right now we're trying to fill. So um, it's gonna get to a point where we already have some electing to be a virtual teacher because of health risks and such that um, if, we, if we have additional teachers that are choosing or, or staff, I should say, not just teachers, choosing not to work because it's, a, it's cost prohibitive to work, um, 
that we were looking at trying to supplement that daycare, whether it's 100%, whether it's 50% of what that cost is. And so right now, this is an initial projection based on some very rough estimates, again, um, to try to supplement that cost or, uh, or to just to decrease the, the yeah. cost for them. Again, these are rough or uh, not final, but just at the elementary level, we have about 750 children, not staff. Some staff have more than one child. Um, uh, a rate that we're kind of using based on our conversations with the YMCA, although they do have sliding, it could go lower for individuals based on some income formula, um, is about $300 for a one child for a month. Okay, now, you know, I don't want to get judgmental for some people that may not seem like a lot, somebody not making a lot, that's a lot when you're not expecting it, that's, so we're, we actually met this morning, um, the, the team that's working on childcare, and that's what Chris was alluding to with. Now I will say, um, this is an anticipation without the data, that some staff members who have their children in school systems now that have chosen to go 100% virtually, um, they may now be in a situation where um, they were not seeking childcare for five days a week because the two school systems I'm speaking about were pretty much had our model. So, um, so we may see an uptick, that's uh, a request. Um, might you see a request to transfer to Stafford County Public Schools? No request of. No, I'm just saying, would that also potentially be a. Oh, well, that would be good for the ADM. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how that would work. I mean, if we hire someone in Stafford County Public Schools, if, if their children were coming to school, but if we were virtual, how would that work? I mean, I would assume they would have to have some childcare arrangements for their children if they're teaching virtually, would they I, not? I, I, my point was just if somebody lives, say, in Spotsylvania County and they thought their children have been going to those schools and they thought their children were going to be doing a hybrid model like the one we've proposed, now they're not. So they might think maybe I want to transfer my kids. I mean, we, we allow... We allow staff to have their children attend our schools if they're out of out of county. Is that just licensed staff? No. It's anybody? Well, right now, uh, yeah, if you're a paraprofessional. Oh, you're talking about for which school for, they go for, to or for, for the child care? No, to bring your child to school. I could be recalling this wrong because it's been a long time since we implemented it, but the Oh, incentive of that program was to try to get more teachers no, I, to come to Stafford County. I wasn't aware that we allow any employee to bring their children to Stafford County because it actually, even though we get more state money account, you know, the, the supervisor's cost is escalated, you know, per child. Right. I think there really are two separate issues. The, the issue that, um, and I think you're right about that. I think it's only uh, licensed employees that could have their children um, and, in our school, but this would be, so for example, if you're a bus driver and you are and you need to drive the bus, um, you could participate in the YMCA program, okay? Um, you could participate if you're a paraprofessional, you could participate if you're a cafeteria employee. Um, now, the question that we need to research is if you're not a Stafford enrolled student. Um, Patrick raised this question, which is a great question, and we need to get some guidance from our uh, our risk insurance. Is um, and you participated in our child care program, um, and you're not one of our students. Is there another added risk to that? Yeah. Would there have to be a rider added to the insurance or something like that? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah. So that's yeah. Is is this estimate for the whole year? That we, that we've identified. Thanks, Mike. Uh, these are annual costs that we've identified as of now, if it was for, if it extended for the full school year. Yes, ma'am. Right. So if we were to be able to go to 100% in school at some point during the school year, 
would this terminate? Yes. Not all of it. I, I think we would still have um, some of the enhanced cleaning and things like that. Even no, if I'm talking about the child care. The jo I'm, I mean, oh, this is $1.5 yeah, million, dollars, right, for the supplemental child care costs for Yeah, staff. the staff child care, I believe, would go away if we were back to 100%. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, did, I understand the question. I think, again, um, if it makes a lot of sense if we think the buildings are not safe, then they shouldn't be safe for child care, too. Okay, we shouldn't have employees in the building. So then I absolutely um, agree. If there's a, and I'm not giving an opinion, I'm just telling you the different things to look at. If we believe, if we think that while you're teaching virtually, you need to be at the building, then the child care does become an issue. Um, so I have reached out to a couple superintendents that had, uh, that have, um, their schools have gone 100 percent virtually to see what they're thinking and uh, and they're 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 addressing that question too they haven't landed on it one was pretty clear that they would allow the teachers um uh, to do matter of fact they actually preferred the teachers to do it virtually from their homes because if there's an issue the spread is at your house not not at the building level so i do think that's something we need to think out a little bit more um Right now, our model's not that direction, you know, so, um, but that's something, if we go there, we need to come to a, um, a you know, a, a quick resolution. Because well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing from, I mean, I think you're probably going to find, I mean, there are teachers who would prefer to have their classroom to go do their virtual stuff in. Yeah. And there's a big difference between having 120 staff in a high school for 2,000 versus having 2,000 students and staff in a high school in terms of COVID-19. So that's going an interesting- to the childcare issue, that's what I'm trying to say. Right, if, gotcha. if, if, they, if staff stay home, then their children stay home. If staff come in, then the child issue care becomes an issue, yeah. yeah. So how accurate is this 1.5 million? Do we have any idea? Um, I would say it's in the ballpark, but until we get actual numbers on the um, exact number of, of students that it would be, uh, or or uh, or children of staff, how many that it would be, um, it's still a rough number. Uh, it's, it's probably not even the full 700 if they attended all three days a week. That's the other thing we don't don't know is um, a lot of these staff members could have something that works out one day of the week, but they only need coverage for two days, or they only need coverage for one day of the week. So, so it's going to be a number that we don't know officially until we get the it's, it's and another thing, yeah another thing that may increase the number when we initially advertise this to staff we were saying K through fifth grade children but they are they are able to take children up to age twelve which would be a sixth grade children so that's why we can't give you a real hard number now we're just um, but yet again you know three hundred dollars for my wife and I would not be a challenge. For other people, especially if you had two or three kids, that 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 becomes a huge, huge challenge. Um, I see a quarter of a million for improved internet services. So um, this is, I mean, sort of a fab question, sort of a, do we know whether, if, if we were to go 100% virtual, um, do we have the bandwidth to have teachers teaching synchronously using yes. Chromebooks so, for, I mean, I just didn't have any idea about whether that's a piece. No, that's a great question because it was asked and, and Jay uh, indicated, yes, we would have the bandwidth um, to do live teaching. And that that's that's also gonna be another change from the spring. We're gonna have more synchronous teaching. Um, now that's on our side, the recipient side could be somewhat different. Okay, so um, that's again, you, you know, and, and I'm assuming that's if the teacher were in the building trying to do synchronous instruction. If the teacher is in their home, it's going to depend on what their home bandwidth and is. Absolutely, if, if there's rules of engagement, that's some. That's a really good point. That if you live in the area where we're already concerned about connectivity, then that's not going to work. Yeah, we're going to have to make some accommodations for teachers that are in those dead zones. Yeah. So if we have to go to all virtual, that they may have to have access to a classroom. 
or the or at least the schools. Chris, you don't have a copy of that. Of the no. And and so uh, again, what is the two hundred fifty thousand doing for the improving of internet services? Uh, so that was actually included on our request. It's something that they work on staff on. So I can't. It was working on, oh, Jay on here? Yeah, no, sorry, I had my mic turned off. But oh. so it was on our request to the Board of Supervisors and it's, so it's been approved and funded by the Board of Supervisors. So that's what my footnote um, is noting there. Uh, but that is something that Jay's worked with the county staff on. Um, and so I don't know the details, maybe, I don't know if, if Campisi does or not, but we can get that information from, from Jay. Yeah. I, I could just tell you real briefly, that was a partnership with the county as they're trying to expand bandwidth throughout. Um, right, that was extending it, I think, to the eastern part yeah, of the yeah. county is what I remember. Yeah, I, I think I remember hearing about that. And then um, I've asked a couple of times, um, so if we have uh, staff or teachers who feel like they need to, for health reasons, documented or undocumented, that they need to take a leave of absence for a year, um, is there anything we can do to help them maintain health insurance coverage um, and any idea of the cost of that? Or So um, I, I actually have been working with Brenda O'Brien, Director of Payroll and Benefits on that uh, the last few days. Um, so I, I think right now there would be some exceptions to policy because right now I think policy states that they, um, if they're on, they don't get the health insurance. Um, uh, but I can, we'll get more clarification on that, but ultimately I think it would be a direction that the board has to give us in there. Typically, if, if somebody is taking a leave or they're unpaid for a period of time, they have to cover the full stipend for, or the full um, premium for the health insurance, which obviously is the employee and the employer portion, not just the employee premium. Um, so if the board wanted to do something differently there, we would have to um, get approval and, and guidance from the board on that. And um, is that something that the healthcare savings account could be used for to offset those costs? Would that be a valid use of, of some of those I funds? I believe so, yes. And I will say, um, I, we haven't looked into it for if somebody was taking a full year leave of absence. So that's a, um, a new spin on it. We were looking at it if, if it was over a few months or, or, or maybe a nine weeks or a, or a semester time frame that for whether it's for health reasons that they were they were taking a significant leave of absence. So um, let me, I'll verify with Brenda what it would look like if we were looking at a full year, um, school year leave of absence. I imagine it would still be um, up to the board. Is that something we want to be bringing to the board, not at next week's meeting? I think that may not give you enough time, but for the, the, the August meeting, you know, a potential um, proposal to have the school system uh, partially subsidize those premiums. And it, I, I think it would have to come from the health benefits fund. But if we were to bring that, I would also like to look into a um, consideration of that if the employee does not return at the end of the period, that there would be an agreement to pay back because the, the expectation would be this is because there's some short term, whether it's a month or a year uh, time away. But if the employee doesn't come back, then I think that it would only be reasonable to to have a, a, a repayment. So if, if that would be a um, potential um, that we could put in there. Sure. Do we want to bring it to the eight, um, August 11th meeting or the August 25th? We might have a better idea what those leave of absences might look like by the 25th. I don't know if we'll have that information by the 11th of August. What do you think? I was just looking at the cost. Then we should okay. have, it, we could bring the cost and then maybe we could bring it for a, um, a decision. If we, if we brought it for information, if it would be so much per employee and it's going to depend on what right. health plan they're under. But I, I, I think it'd be a great idea if we could at least pay the employer portion and even considering, um, you know, paying the, the employee portion if it were affordable right. under could the circumstances. Could you those numbers down for us? Yeah, yeah, and certainly. Then, um, we, we have that for each level of our health 
health plans, what the employee and employer portion is. Um, so another thing I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of, of teachers is a lot of concern, confusion about what happens if they get COVID and they're having to like, or that they've been exposed and they're quarantined or they're asked to quarantine, but they don't actually have COVID. Are they going to end up using up all their sick leave? Yes. And so, so just what have you all? Yeah. So we, we've addressed this. It's so I, I, it's a definitely a very popular question. Um, so one thing I would always recommend is on our website, our frequently asked question that's, that's on there. Um, Patrick has sent something out to all staff that it's 10 days, just so you know, um, there's some legislation that uh, they get 10 emergency um, leave days. And then usually the quarantine is about 14 days. So with the two weekends, it's pretty much covered. Um, and then if you end up having to be quarantined again, you get it um, again. So, uh, and that was just discussed at the town hall. So I absolutely know that question happens um, is often asked. Yeah. So let me just, I, I just want to be clear about what you're saying. So what you're saying is the state has said that if I, let's say I'm in a classroom and a student was positive for COVID. And so the school division decides that that class is going to be quarantined and that the teacher needs to quarantine for two weeks. So the teacher is would there be a difference? Like if the teacher's quarantined, but they feel able to keep doing their virtual instruction, would that then not be considered part of that leave? But then if they actually are sick and they can't do the instruction, I mean, if, if, if you're requiring me to be quarantined because of possible exposure, but I'm still able to work, would that be a leave? Uh, so, so this is what I would offer. Next week, when Patrick's going to talk about those other personnel policies, I'd rather put him in front of the board than me. Just... But but you might share that question yeah. with him of of clarification, yeah. because if, if we're the ones telling them that they need to be quarantined and they're not sick and they could actually be doing their job, yeah. it would seem like they might prefer not to be having to use up. And, these, and we other... might not want them to be using right. up those days. And I'm not too. saying this is going to happen, but at the bus meeting today, town hall, let's this is a terrible thing to say, but I, I go to Miami tonight, I go bar hopping, and then I go to beach tomorrow, and then I get quarant then I get COVID. Um, and now I tell you I have COVID, I can't go to work. You know, how do so there is a I think it might be more federal than state on this 10 day, but Patrick could he he would be the best person to walk it through it. So you all share with him we'd like more yeah, information yeah. about I but when I don't know when would that come to the board. Yeah, and that's an interesting question because I was just talking with a teacher from Fairfax today and she told me that if she has to self-quarantine the first time she gets paid leave, but the next time she's required to use her leave. I'm not suggesting that, well, double, but yeah, so this, is, I, this is just what... Is that, did I say it wrong? Before? Well, I actually, I asked the same question to Patrick today and the 10 days is actually an, over an annual, not a per um, instance. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it's always right. But I think that's something we need to look at. I mean, if a teacher has to quarantine along with a class, I mean, or, you know, it, I guess it depends on the contract tracing and, and if you can trace it down to having arisen from the school, it doesn't seem fair that we're going to make a teacher take leave no, because they have to quarantine that, right? a second yeah. time. That's so it's the, something I, I think peril. we need to, to look at. So can we have uh, Patrick, bring this to the August 11th meeting as an information item to kind of clarify this. And then we'll also discuss the um, health care premium support for those on leave of absence at the same time. So if we could have, does that sound reasonable? I'll just, um, I should, it'll be very, very, very preliminary, but I'll, I'll try to at least at a high level tell you what the status of the health benefits fund is um, at that time to, to give a little background. I know we emptied some of it into the um, into the trust fund, so there's not as much as there was. Yeah, so officially we haven't done that transfer yet. Oh. oh. Um, so it was a, it was approved <laughs> and it was kind of put on hold because everything went downhill there in, in March. So 
right at the same time that the board of supervisors, they approved it. And then, um, so I look at it as a good thing because of the uncertainties. Now we can use those funds for other so items. So can we just keep maintaining that hold then? And if we have to, do we, can we go through a process to reverse it? I think the board would have to decide right. that, but right. Would the board of supervisors have to decide it or could was the school board have to decide? Uh, so I missed part of that. You're saying if we decide to move some of it or? If we decide yeah. not to move it because of, of new unanticipated costs related mm -hmm. to these, the, the leaves, if, if people have to quarantine and the, the premium support, can we withdraw that um, transfer? Do, can we have be authorized to do that or do we yeah. have to go through the Board of Supervisors? Now? Yeah, so in my opinion, we have not made that transfer yet. So it is still sitting in, the, in our health benefits fund, which means we still control that. Um, so we've more or less canceled that, that transfer. And in fact, now that we're in a new fiscal year, I'm not sure if we would have the authority to make that transfer. I'd have to look at the language of the resolution to see if the appropriation still stands, it falls into this year or not. Um, well, we would definitely want to communicate with the Board of Supervisors if we're going to do a chain and, and explain yeah. why. And I, I would anticipate that they would understand and, and all of that, but we can, we can, that's something the board will need to decide. And, and I suggest we report on that status to our board so that our board is, is aware of it. But even if we had made the transfer, we could take money out of that fund for the retirees benefits, yes, which are several million dollars a year. Um, so one way or another, we have access to it. Yes. And my recollection was we were only putting a portion, you know, really Yeah, we were still a, a so it was about 14.7 million dollars we were had approved to transfer into the health or to the OPEB trust fund, but we still left ourselves um I forget the amount above and beyond our reserve, but we it's left an additional money. reserve of um several million dollars still right. in the health savings so uh, we health need benefits. To, we just need to report to the the board that that this is on hold and that at such time that that uh, you're in a position to make a recommendation to FAB to recommend to the, the board that we take some action, we need to bring it back. Sure. Right, and, and we could certainly make the argument that we may see an increase in our healthcare costs this year because mm -hmm. of COVID over what we would normally see. It's possible. We self-insure yeah. and that money would be used. Absolutely. Right. So we, and, and I've, I've told the FAB and the full board uh, probably a couple different times mentioned about the health insurance was, um, fluctuating pretty drastically there at the end of the year. We saw some major drops, then it picked back up at the end of the year. And and I fully expect that um, a lot of those procedures that got delayed are going to be rescheduled for the summer. So we might see another spike. So uh, just because we had the savings, and, I, and I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know what those final numbers were in the health benefits fund. I know they were starting to look like they were going to break even exactly and not necessarily have a lot of savings, but uh, waiting on getting those final numbers. Can you tell me what the additional instructional needs and supplement nutrition fund balance, what those are? Uh, yeah, so high level on the additional instructional needs, those are expanded like. Just, I, I, I hit it and turned it off instead of turn it on, I had left it on. So the instructional needs are, um, um, those were provided by, by Jan and Laud, and a lot of that is expanding software for licenses, um, is, is the bulk majority of that. The, Supplement nutrition fund balance, our, um, our nutrition fund, so our, our lunch and breakfast program um, is basically um, more or less, it's an internal service fund, it's an it's a, um, a enterprise business fund. So they rely on sales to, uh, to cover their expenditures. And they've, they've always, you know, it's meant to break even, always has there's some positive fund balance in there at the end of the year. Um, but with the um, restrictions on this next school year, they are not going to be able to have the same level of sales that they have had in the past, which means they're currently projecting a loss. And that's another one that's really tough to project because we don't have data to compare to. Um, we know that we can still provide meals. Um, a lot of the funding in our nutrition fund comes from the federal um, school lunch program. So a lot of our meals are reimbursed for our, our free and reduced um, children reimburse us from the federal. So we know we can still get those in the hands of the kids and we can um, send meals home with them, kind of like we've done the, the delivery model now. So we can send breakfast and lunch and we can get the reimbursements from them. But where we're gonna um, see major reductions is our, our sales for our in-person, um, uh, non-free and reduced 
children. And since they're only in, in school two days a week in the hybrid program, we're going to see a reduction there. So is, is that because we're choosing to keep people employed to not make as many meals? Like, I mean, is, is, yeah, so we we project we're going to need all of our staff at this point because now we're taking them and we're delivering them to the to the classrooms and the elementary school level, and so uh, we're still going to need as many there each day. Um, it's just our sales are going to we're going to projecting to see a drop in our sales. So we're not going to have the cash in our in our nutrition fund to maintain. Um, I'll tell you my preliminary conversations with other school superintendents who are closed for either the quarter or the semester, um, they're looking for ways to keep their staff employed, you know, find different responsibilities and so on. So, um, you know, anyway, I just want to mention that. So. Have we looked into or thought about what the nutrition staff will be doing on Mondays when there'll be very, very limited number of students in the schools? Yeah, so so we are looking at maintaining our um, meal delivery models. Um, we got to get some things worked out with the state there. So we'll still need the the nutrition staff. Maybe not all of them, but we're gonna we're gonna need staffing to um, prep those meals and and get them ready to get them on a bus and get them out or as a pickup location. Um, but I can't say definitively we're gonna do that until we get um, some more guidance from the, the state and federal government on whether the they've extended the waiver currently. The the waiver is only through, I believe, the end of August. So we'll, we're going to continue our program up until a week or two before school starts. Uh, but once once we get into September, we have to kind of alter that program unless we get more guidance from the, the state. And obviously, as you mentioned, we will have some kids in the building, so we'll, we'll be feeding them on the Mondays. Do we have any projections of how many students we'll have in the buildings on Mondays? No, not at all. Not, not yet. No. When when will we know that? Well, uh, George and his team are holding the IEP meetings, um, so that's going to drive it. And then the principals will work with their staff to um, um, begin to identify. But I think it's going to be one of the things where we'll probably start slower, uh, lower, and then as they assess children to Tuesday to um, Friday to to determine which students need. Um, the additional Monday. So um, I could see that gradually increasing. Um. Okay, there's not any other questions. Can we move on to the um, HVAC systems and any changes that we may have to make or um, improvements and what those might cost? Yeah, so I know, I think, um, I believe this was an item that was added uh, by Ms. Hollerback, but uh, I, I've talk to John about this uh, in, in pretty big detail. So we're working one, just as an FYI, we're gonna have like a SOP document internally and for kind of an external uh, for, for parents and students to see the changes that we're making as far as the cleaning, the enhanced cleaning. Um, it'll also include some of the changes we're making making, making on a from a maintenance standpoint. Um, so we've explored different different filters. And right now, our, the biggest change we're going to make is increasing the frequency of our Ill air filter changes. Um, so we're, we're working even with some engineers and, and stuff to look at to see, can we even make changes to our filters? We can obviously change our filters more frequently, just like you can do in your home to um, a, a fog filter that would re limit your airflow, put stress on the system. So it's kind of similar. If you put a filter in there, that's not the proper filter to work in that HVAC system it can cause significant damage to your system and and obviously that's not going to be beneficial we don't want to do something to, to harm it so right now we're we're looking at increasing the frequency of of the rotation of when we change those air filters and so once you all have that information that would also be added to project projected additional costs due to covid is that would yeah that um i don't see it as a significant increase in our or in our maintenance costs at at this time um, we're also going to be running the systems earlier in the day um, to bring in more fresh air and, and also after the building is unoccupied. And uh, we're going to do an evaluation of all of our mechanical systems. Uh, about half the schools were included in the train contract, and we're going to pay particular attention to airflow and exhaust. And then we have a proposal that we're already proceeding with the purchase order for um, evaluation of the other schools. So we're taking a lot of 
good action and um, all of the schools in the country are in the same position. They're, they're just trying to make their systems work as best they can. Um, none of this is a silver bullet. It's going to, um, um, it's going to help minimize risk. Though. Yeah. For grads, it was a good point John made of, of trying to get that air circulation before kids are actually in the building. So one of the recommendations that's been out there is um, uh, increasing that airflow early um, before, before occupancy occupation or um, the buildings being occupied. So um, we are going to do that as well. Okay, moving on to stipends for the fall, fall semester. Uh, Madam Chairman, I ask that this oh. be put on the agenda. And the reason is I wanted to at least have a look at this and a consideration of what happens if we don't have the VHSL activities in the fall. So um, it's I didn't give you the hard copy because it was a, a few more pages and and I added it to the agenda um, today. So it's it's on the live version now. But I think Dr. Kisner had mentioned that he maybe he had already shared it with you. But uh, VHSL released a statement that talked about what they're looking at doing and um, the kind of the chatter is is that Model Three, which would be um, right now they're still gonna, I think it's called Model Three or uh, or is is looking at condensed seasons for, for all the sports, but still having all the sports and so looking at shifting the fall sports to the winter. So, um, but they're making the final decision uh, later in July, I think July 29th, if I remember correctly, the, somewhere near the end of July. And so that's when we'll have more certainty on what the, what their, at least their current expectation is. Right. I mean, I, I, I'll be stunned if they're able to do sports in December. I mean, I just, just given, flu and 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 covid together i would just be absolutely amazed if that actually happens but that's just my editorial comment yeah i have to agree that i i find it hard to believe that we're going to have contact sports when we have flu and a pandemic at the same time and i and i'm personally don't believe that it's, it makes sense to have contact sports that you know further enhance the risk for transmission but um do we want to defer making any recommendations about um, fall sports stipends until we have the ruling from VHSL? Yeah, I don't think we're in a position to make that. I, at the time I requested this, I didn't have anything from the VHSL that's very recent. But I think it's something that we need to keep in mind because we're looking at over $3 million for stipends. And I don't want to be in a position where there is an expectation that a stipend is going to be paid if we're unable to have the the, the activity. I, I know in, in, the, in the spring it was very different because we were all caught by surprise. There was no advance. It was just go on spring break and you don't come back. But now that we have this notice and we, we know we're not gonna be starting the school year with any of these um, VHSL activities, or as I understand it, at best, it's going to be started in the winter. Is that correct, Dr. King? Yeah, so they would, uh, well, go on. I was going to say, they're still going to have all, right now, they're still projecting to have all sports. It's just going to start in the winter. The fall sports are going to move between the winter and the spring sports. Right, but when they're condensed, would that be the same amount of time? Um, yeah, so the season? that's another thing. The VSHL has it. approved. Now, our ADs, I learned this today for this meeting. Our ADs, so they, the, first, what the VSHL approved. They approved that teams can start conditioning and practicing following social distancing. So you can't be running into each other, but you could do calisthenics and things like that. So, um, so I recognize what you're saying, but I, I just I want to bring out that the coaches work more than just the game. Okay, there's a lot of things that lead up to the game. Um, now, if the VSHL rules uh, soon that we're not having all sports any time this year, um, then you know that that is different than we are delaying it to the winter um, because they've given approval already that you can meet with your team to do levels of um, again conditioning. So, so I have a couple questions. One, are these numbers just sports, or are these all the stipends? All. Okay, these so, are all stipends. so, 
so lead teachers, for example, might still be something where the individual is still having to do things or um, yeah, we so might still be having some, um, do they have mentors in here? Is that not mentor coordinator, that mentor kind teachers. of thing? Yeah, there yeah. are mentor teachers, okay. which um, um, would but, still but be I, needed. I, I do have to say, um, I've been getting so many emails from staff who are so concerned about this virus. Um, are these coaches not concerned about this virus? Well, I'm not going to, I mean, I, I don't, I, I can't speak for them. I mean. I just, I personally think that um, the risk of, of, you know, one of the things of social distancing is to try to minimize your interactions with other people. And so to pro try to progress with a fall sports schedule just seems somewhat irresponsible in light of a global health crisis. So I'm just, um, I'm just not sure that we should even be considering it regardless of what VHSL rules. But that's just, I'm just one person. That's just my opinion. Well, I, I would like to get some information once we have the VHL decision as to what the season looks like with the condensed. I mean, if it's a significant difference, then I think we do need to look at the, the stipends. And, and again, I'm, I'm all about being fair. But if we're, if we're condensing the season, then it seems it shouldn't have the same price tag with it. When we're talking about millions of dollars with these other expenses, we know we're going to incur. And again, I just don't want there to be an expectation that this is a a given. Or is may, perhaps I'm, you know, not correct. Is 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 there any uh, communication with the staff on the stipends? Or uh, I'm, and so, I'm talking right now about the VHSL activities that are, you know, not yet defined when and if they're going to be able to go forward. I mean, I, I know that we have this conversation every year and, and I know I find myself in the minority, but I work for you guys, so it doesn't matter if, um, and I would just maybe just suggest that um, one, I know it adds up to $3 million. I will tell you percentage wise of our budget compared to other school divisions. Uh, this is not a huge amount, but it is a huge amount in the aggregate, I get that. Um, uh, a lot of our, if we want to stay with sports for now, um, one group of people that a lot of our kids need the contact and socialization, and a lot of our coaches did virtual um, uh, you know, exercise and things of that nature. Um, the other thing we hear a lot from teachers and everyone is the concern about their money with extra expenses. Uh, I would just, you know, I, I guess what I would rather do to help the board make a more informed decision is at least have uh, maybe the athletic directors or some coaches come and speak um, because I, I'm not coming to a conclusion that even with a condensed schedule that you're working any um, less hours, okay, if we're measuring it by hours. And for a lot of our children, a lot of our students, um, this is part of their, this is an important part. Um, uh, and I have to also tell you, the national agenda is not helping out either. When, other t when, when the sports are opening up, baseball's opening up, and, and you know, next week, and, and basketball's opening up. Yeah, that's true, but they also can get COVID tests on demand, like every but, day. But it, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it gets, you know, I, I got an email from a Mountain View student um, uh, yesterday, which I wrote back to. And, you know, I don't know the student at all, but it was a really, it, from his point of view, what it means not to be in school. I know what he spoke about. He spoke about sports, and I'm not going to take that away from him. Okay, that's what he saw. So I, I just well, don't know. When, when, you, when you hear about the sports teams that get together and they start conditioning and then you have half the team come down with COVID and that half team has been in the schools and now you're having to quarantine, that's a potential problem. So um, I don't think it's, it's, 
it's not just affecting those students, it's affecting every student in the school if we have to shut down because of an outbreak due to conditioning for sports. But then I also get emails saying, why can't we open up our fields for travel teams? It, you know, we, we you know, um, Spotsylvania, everybody has travel teams playing in their fields. So we, we shouldn't leap into this thing that if we're not doing, the kids are still, some kids are still doing sports. For some kids, the sports will only come to be happening at Stafford schools because they can't afford to be on the travel teams. I, I just think, um, I think if we're doing it for money, that's one purpose, okay? And, and, and that I could accept, but I just rather um, give the why, you know, to explain to people that um, it's, it's a funding issue, but I just don't want to conclude right now that these coaches are not going to be, if, this, if, if they shut down sports, no, we are, for 2021, there will be no competitive sports, then everything I'm saying is off the table, okay? But well, if they are going to condense a schedule, I still think the coaches are going to put in uh, the hours to justify the pay that they're getting. I, I'm just concerned that the VHSL has just got a, their own agenda and conflict of interest in making this decision and that they're going to... So I don't want to find us suddenly in December, we have no sports, but we've already handed out this money. So when does stipends start being paid to people well, the, okay. all right, just a high level, the stipends are paid um, near the end of each season. So a spring coach is not getting their stipend until probably um, May or June and probably June 1st is the typical time frame. Uh, usually a fall, if under the normal circumstances, a fall coach is getting their stipend um, November, December, uh, probably December 1st paycheck and then you know, so forth. The winter coaches would be, so it's usually right there See, I'm not want to say the season's completely done, but it's right there, depending on where the pay uh, pay periods fall, that it's right at the end of the season. So, ultimately, to answer your question, they're not going to be paid until there actually is a season. Yes. Um, can we find out at some future time what the schools that are in 100% virtual are doing with respect to sports? Yes, I could, I could look at that. Yeah, that's a great question. If you're virt if you're shut down, are you are you opening up just for the right. the chance of sports? That's I mean, we to echo Dr. Chase, we are getting a significant amount of correspondence from our staff who are concerned about potential exposure, you know, being, you know, at the school in the classroom. I don't see that it would be that much difference depending if you were conditioning in the school. Perhaps if they're conditioning outside, there'd be more room for social distancing. But if we're in our, um, what, do you, what do they call those rooms? You know, those, the weight room. Yeah, in the, in the weight room, there's you know limited amount of space. Um, and I, I certainly don't want to do anything that's going to put anyone, either our students or our staff or I know some of our coaches are, are not full-time staff or they may come in just to coach, but I, I don't want to put any additional risk there. And I, I understand that I've always been a huge proponent for sports because I know there's some students that come to school because of the sports and it's also because of the arts and the, the music and the drama. But I think we have to start looking very hard right now on if we're going to maintain the best efforts to keep it safe, you know, what, what do we need to, to look at and, and what do we need to change? So I'm, I guess my, my, my comment is that let's be consistent with all the stipends. If we're not having, you know, marching band, then, then marching band. I, I, I guess. And, and chorus, I, I just, you're, we're not going to have chorus. People are if, not going to go there's, do. If there's some <laughs> stipends we're giving people that, um, again, and uh, if you if you may not have recall, but I started out my comments with the VHL VHSL sponsored activities, which do include, you know, the a lot more than just a lot more than just athletics. But I would not want to to address the lead teacher, the mentors, 
the positions that we've had on here for staff that are working with other staff members, because I'm assuming that we're still going to need the lead teachers. We're still going to need the mentors. Oh, we're going, still going to need some of these um, support services, you know, in the building. So I was not limiting my comments to athletics. It's the VHSL, VHSL competitive activities. And, so, uh, and again, it had, it's, it's, you know, my concern is from a safety factor. If it is safe to have the air students performing, you know, or participating in these events, yes, let's do it. And I'd say if someone is going 100% virtual and we have a hybrid, that they should be allowed to come to school to participate in it because they're still students. Oh, yeah. Um, but and if we're 100% virtual, if we were, hypothetically, then I think that's that's very different because the rationale for that, I'm presuming, would be the, the health and safety. In, in March, when we closed the schools down, we said everything's closed. So all, you know, it was our facilities were closed. So I absolutely agree. Um, th th then it's a non-issue to me. You know, if we're closing down for the health reasons, then that that's anything that takes place in our, our building. L I, I want to, out of curiosity, just call other school divisions and to see how to the, your question or the, whoever asked it, to see how they're using, how they're going to handle the sports, uh, because we have enough examples now between Arlington and Richmond that are doing it for a whole semester, that um, we'll see how they're they're covering the sports. Or Prince William's going to go. Yeah, they did nine weeks. You know, yeah, um, part of a semester. But I would not limit it to sports. I would I would ask about extracurricular if they want to differentiate sports from the other extracurricular. They can. I'll just do VSHL. That's the Right. You know, my concern again is is safety. It, it really has less to do with the stipends because especially, you know, if we look at the winter amount, because maybe we wouldn't have to cancel all of them. My concern is the safety issue, that these are often contact sports, that the kids are often in, in, in close proximity to each other. Um, are they going to be traveling? There are all sorts of um, more health related issues that make me concerned. I understand that, that sports is very important to most of these kids, but I'm still looking at it from the point that is this the best thing? Should we, should we be encouraging this type of um, activity it, when we're trying so hard to prevent the spread of the disease and the right. transmission? And, and again, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying that right now the VHSL is actually being very deliberate in, in their phases. So right now, if you want to have any conditioning with your students, uh, your athletes, it cannot be contact. You have to follow 10 feet social distancing. I mean, they, they so, and, and that's why, um, you know, that's why everything's being delayed because they, they're looking at the science of the state because, um, but although I really believe as a school board, you could go over, you could choose uh, you don't have to follow their guidance. You could say, you know what, for Stafford's, um, uh, thank you, VHSL, but we're going to suspend um, the season of, based on health concerns. And, um, and, and for me, I just want to, you know, you've handed us projections of six and a half million dollars of additional expenses. Um, and I don't know that if we go across the street, that I, I see 2000 in carryover, but we're going across the street and asking the, the county to, to give us this. Um, and I see that another potential way of paying for it is to delay the purchase of five school buses. So that's going to come. So I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, there's a lot of money here. We're, we're, we don't seem to want to make any any cuts, we just want to keep adding costs. And I'm well, just but, worried uh, about let, that. I, I do need to comment on that. When I see a Prince William, and I heard it last night on their school board, $44 million they asked their board supervisor. Yes, they're three times our size. Okay, so I do have one metric, but I know what other school system. I don't personally would encourage the board. Um, there's a reason why we're asking a lot of these things because our budget being where it is, limits our capability. Okay, and so um, 
if we were in the top 50, 60, 70, 80 of per pupil expenditure, I would maybe not say that. But I know from uh, as my daughter who's going to be put, I had a meeting with the high school principals this morning. Great concern as they have teachers that will be out because of health risk. We're not in a position right now, budget wise, to say, OK, you lose this chemistry teacher. She'll have to do virtual courses. You still have kids that are coming into the building who need chemistry. Now we're saying you have to, we, we can't double it. My daughter who works in Fairfax, because she's pregnant, she is not going to be coming in. They have a replacement for her, okay? So I don't think I would encourage us. We should ask for the, it's not, you know, it's less than $6 because we think we have some ways of paying it. But this is what we need. This is a COVID-19. Um, they got $13.3 in CARES. We got $1.5. They did give us 1.2, 1.3, or something like that. What did they give us? About 1.5 plus. Yeah. In the Chromebooks, just we may have to pay back. I mean, that in their resolution, we have to pay back. So, um, I, I guess what I'm just saying is this is not the time to be cutting. Um, this is maybe a, a good time to have a conversation with them and explain our needs. Um, but you know, we give you the link of the article, and then I heard it last night because I actually watched the Prince William School Board meeting at 2.30 in the morning. This don't, my life is very interesting. Um, <laughs> and let me tell you one thing. I shouldn't say that, I'm going to shut off the mic. I have a much greater respect for all seven of you. <laughs> it is not greener on the other side. Let me tell you. Um, uh, but anyway, so. That, that um, should have been on the mic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I will tell you another we challenge that we're going to have. We, <laughs> uh, and we'll know more about this in, a, in, a, in two months. And the state is trying to work this out. And I've been very active in advocating a position is our ADM. Um, because we built a budget on a projected ADM. We lowered it. Um, if you remember at the last minute, you know, we're not sure we lowered it enough. Um, we're seeing one area that we're, we're not seeing the numbers we think they're going to show up but they're not showing up yet it has a lot to do with our schools being closed is kindergarten um you know we're down hundreds uh, you know we're down hundreds so um the state is looking at different ways you know they kept everybody harmless pretty much on the march 31st i don't want to be kept harmless i want to because we anticipate i want more than harmless if i was down in Martinsville, i definitely would like to be kept harmless but here I, we budget for more children so we're so there's a cadre of superintendents that are advocating that what we built our budget on, and the state gives you ADM projections back in the spring, that that's the number they should fund us on. So we'll have a lot more to talk about then as we go down the road. But that's that's something that we need to put on our radar is what will our numbers really be compared to what we built our budget on, and then what is the state? How is the state responding? Now, one good news that you might have saw in the papers or didn't get, maybe it made in a local paper, the state's deficit projections are not as bad as they initially thought. So you know, we're a little bit more hopeful that that will help us in, in base, basic state aid. Right, but we don't know what's going to happen six months from now. Right, yeah. yeah. One question I have, and not not for an answer this evening, but I think it might be helpful when we are we are going forth with asking for additional funding, is are we anticipating the need for more teachers, more classrooms? Because by dividing our classes in half, I mean if we're talking maximum of twelve in a room, we may have had more than twenty four. I mean, I know we had our our targets, but are we going to actually need more teachers? based on the, the projections and we can only do it you know as of now or whatever date you're ready to have a projection but i would not be surprised if we don't need more teachers because of what we are doing you know in the classrooms and as you said you know if we need full-time virtual that you really can't do the virtual full-time and and the hybrid and and i i'd like to get some some more sense of that and and it, it's i'll say it's related to the yeah, the the fab, but in, in terms of how this is going to work with the 
the the hybrid and the virtual going um, the three days. And I think Dr. Chase brought up at our last meeting, you know, can the specialist you know be helping someone that? But if if that's going to incur more costs, then that may be a basis for supporting uh, a portion of our request. So it's it's something to think about because it may end up not necessarily how much we need, it's how much we can recruit and sign up before school starts. Right, and, and the initial concern, and, and that's why at seven o'clock this morning, Ms. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Nichols, I met with all the high school principals, is this, we have a hundred, and I think I told you 103, it's really 104, 104 teachers. We have more employees, but 104 teachers that submitted for a health accommodation. Um, but again, it, it just doesn't, so I could use Mountain View as a real example. I won't, so they're, one of their science teachers, I, I don't want to mention which science, is needs a health accommodation, but she teaches kids in many different sections. So there's, if, if, if all those section kids wanted to go remotely, that would work perfectly, but that's not happening. So, um, so have we considered at all the possibility of um, some classes only being offered remote or that, that if you're taking that particular science at that particular school, it's going to be completely remote. And that also solves the problem of less transition for those students, that they will not be taking that class in the building at all. Well, we did think that, and we also thought that teacher now, and maybe we got a, and I'm just using this term, a $50 adult, and I hate to use that, who could be in the room to supervise, that from her home or his home, she would be brought, it would be like the reverse remote, that the kids would be in the classroom, but the teacher would be teaching from his or her home, and we would just have an adult there for the help. You'd have a facilitator. facilitator. Yeah, facilitator, yeah. That's what we used to do with Virtual Virginia yeah. when we had it. You know, the, the students were in a room doing the Virtual Virginia, and we had a presence and and we've also done that when we broadcast a class from yeah that was the original distance learning when right. you remember how people used to do it yeah. so i will um uh um let you know as we proceed as the school year goes on which of these stipends made sense pre-covid and make less sense um covid Okay, I'd like to say post-COVID, but that's not happening yet. Yeah. Right, like so one one of the VHSL events that was particularly near and dear to the people in my house was robotics. But you can't have kids building a robot together, exchanging tools collectively during COVID. I mean, you just can't safely do it. So... Um, and is VHSL going to make any distinction between the type of sport? I need to get on their executive board next year. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess my question is, is should we make a recommendation to the school board to evaluate, to make a decision about fall activities so that we aren't dependent on the VHSL to make that decision? Do we want to look at it strictly from a public health issue that... And, and because there is so much um, ambiguity about what is going to be transpiring, or do we want to just wait until the HSL makes the decision? I, I, I'm, you know, if they're really going to make a decision July 25th, did you say? I, I think. 29th? I think that's talking, our, our representative um, for Region 3, uh, he feels that they need to make a decision because a lot of school divisions are having this the same conversation. And and then I you also mentioned that you would be in touch with schools that have gone completely virtual yeah, yeah, definitely going and ask them about that as well, because that is certainly a very interesting message <laughs> that you're you're decided that what's appropriate for your school division is that they'll be a hundred percent virtual, but you still do VHSL activities. So I'd like more information on that. And and, and this I, I'm just gonna this is the school psychologist part of me. Um, we have so many people right now that you're hearing from, and then you have people that you're not hearing from. And um, and I would just maybe offer what reason you may not 
you know, we do have 4,000 employees. I'm not taking anything away from anybody you heard from, but you did not hear from the majority of your employees now. I, and so you do have some, I don't know if culture is the right word, maybe sports is it, its own culture, that um, to answer your question, they don't see this. You know, I don't want to speak for them. I mean, the, the, the coaches, no one's forcing a coach to take a stipend. I mean, you, this is the easy position to give up of, of your position, okay? So, um, so maybe we allow VSHL a little bit more time to give us guidance, and then we know, instead of being in front of them, uh, let them be in front of us and tell us what they're, what they're doing. So maybe this could stay as old business for, yes. for the fab so that it doesn't get, you know, it doesn't get forgotten. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure Dr. Kisner will still reach out, but I imagine some of the answer might be that if the sports seasons have been delayed right now, that it's after the first nine weeks at, and later in the semester. So that's probably not, they might not have an answer yet of what they're going to do because it's not in that immediate future. So does that mean that since we're delaying the the, the, the event is not going to start till December that we wouldn't be doing conditioning right now? No. Well, that's the question is, are they still doing some sort of well, conditioning our, our, that is our, allowed? Uh, so our coaches decided to hold off on conditioning. Um, uh, and they actually, I learned that they, the athletic directors met this morning with Mike Justice. And because of VSHL's, if they're going to make a decision, we're not having the sports, then there's no reason to go through all this. Conditioning. So I, I do applaud them that they they're waiting for more guidance before um, they pursue. So, well, I guess we will put it on the agenda for old business, and we will kind of defer if we could just get more information on yeah um, the stipends you talked about, and um, we'll see what they decide. Is there any other? Are there any other questions? I suggest we adjourn. Get used to this chair.